Hello and welcome to Coffee with Candace. I'm your host, Candace Mama. Today's guest is extraordinary in every single way. His name is Maps Mapunyani. He's a TV presenter, an actor, an entrepreneur, a UNICEF advocate. But for me, what stands out the most about Maps is he's so incredibly grounded in who he is. I cannot wait to have this conversation, but before I do, don't forget, if you like this podcast, like, share, and subscribe. Now, without any further ado, here's Maps. <laughs> How are you? Very good, thank you. Happy Heritage Day. Oh, thank you, you too. And thank you for spending time with me on Heritage Day. Of course, absolutely, absolutely. Sorry, I hope we're not like um, live and everything and um, you're running behind as a result of all of that, but it's uh, awesome to be having a conversation with you. No, not at all, this is perfect. Um, but no, seriously, I just want to say thank you so much because I know how busy you are. I mean, you're running a business, Buns Out, which is doing incredible, just by the way. Uh, you're the ambassador of a million different things. You're a TV presenter. I mean, I don't even know what it is that you don't do. Uh, so yeah. I'm just, <laughs> I'm like so humble. I'm like, thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to talking to you because I had such a great conversation last time with you and I see the great conversations that you have and the people that you have them with and for me to be worthy of being on is pretty awesome. No, it's incredible. Thank you. But actually let's is the camera quality okay? Yeah, you're perfect. Everything's perfect. perfect. Thank you. Fantastic. No, so I actually want to start there. The first time we met. I I remember oh. thinking to myself like oh my gosh, you've got so much to say and so many people would benefit from hearing you say it. And I think for me, the first thing that actually stuck out before we get into the conversation was you just seem so centered in yourself. You seem like someone who's very settled with who you are. Have you always been that way? I think I've always been very conscious and I've always made the effort to consider who I am with everything that I do, if that makes sense. So um, lots of people just kind of do and hope it lands onto who they are. But I try and consider while actively working out more and more who I really am with everything that I do um, that allows me to hit that spot a whole lot more consistently as opposed to, you know, just kind of throwing um you know throwing mud at the wall and hoping something sticks essentially but with having a, a fair idea because i'm always very conscious of it as opposed to you know always having five different thoughts of who you might be i think i've always thought of who i who i who i am really who i'm wanting to be and all the things i need to do towards that growth and by considering that i think i've found myself being a whole lot more aware at every moment of my my every action yeah and it comes that across. Sense? no it does it does it comes across because you're living a conscious life you're very conscious of the person you're trying to be and the person you're becoming right yeah yeah so my life my, my, my kind of um one of my philosophies uh especially over the last few years and i think i just carried i've carried it through um you know into the present is to do everything that I do is to do those things as intentionally and as deliberately as I possibly can. Um, and with that, I find that I then have very little, um, very little disappointments, very little regrets, um, all those kinds of things, because I'm doing the things that I really thought through and I can't be hard on myself um, when it comes to that, because, you know, in this game of life, which essentially is a game that we're all playing, you're not always going to make the right call. But if you do, if you make the calls that you feel are true to who you are um, or to who you are in that moment or who you were in that moment, then you have nothing to, to you know, kind of be disappointed or, or complain about. Um, if you know that you'll be able to put in the full effort, um, if you know that, you know, you, you, you've done your best when you're going for things that are perhaps a, li a little bit more of a higher reach than usual, um, and you've deliberately gone through the actions that will require you to try get to that point, and perhaps you just fall short, or you get it, whatever it might be, you have to be pleased with your effort because it's, a, it's something that you've actively decided on. And I think for me, it's important to be able to do that. Um, and that, I think, is what really keeps me 
um, you know, kind of level-headed with, with a lot of the things that happen on a daily basis. It keeps me, it keeps me clear and conscious. Oh, that's beautiful. So you mentioned something about, you know, being hard on yourself. Is this something you struggled with prior to living so intentionally? It's something I still struggle with, I think, because even with the intentionalities, um, you still want the best of yourself because you hold such high standards for who you are um, or for, for actually that's completely wrong, not for who you are, for, for who you potentially feel that you can be. So people, people always ask me, what's that one life regret that you have? Or um, perhaps regret's not the word. What's your biggest fear? That's the word, sorry. Um, what's that one fear that you have? And I don't live in fear. I, I actually get spurred on by fear. My most exciting things that I get involved in, um, my biggest motivators, how I get my day going, what really makes me feel energized is the fact that I just might fail at something. Um, you know, when there's that little bit of fear, um, not to say that I don't, it's just to say that if there's a big chance of failure and I am about to do something that really makes me uncomfortable and slightly fearful, it means that I'm doing something worth doing. If I find that I'm way too comfortable and then I don't have that little slight fear and that there isn't a great possibility of failure, then I know that I'm not pushing myself. I know that I'm not doing what I really possibly could. I'm not um, living out of my comfort zone enough. I'm not doing anything that's exciting and that for me is worth living. It's different for many people. That for me is worth living and is moving towards my flow, my, um, my challenges meeting my level of skill and I'm improving my skill set as much as I can and therefore I'm taking on bigger challenges and when you have that high challenge with that high set of skill, that's when life gets really exciting. So when people ever ask me, like, what is your biggest fear? I don't live in fear at all with anything that I do. But my biggest fear, I think that in a way, subtly and subconsciously feeds a lot of my decisions and will be the determining kind of thing at the end of my life will be whether or not I feel that I am, I've lived or I am living out my potential. And I think my biggest fear is you know, kicking the bucket and not really living out my, 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 my true potential. Um, and that's what I'm always working towards. And I think that's why I squeeze the, the, the time that I can out of my days. Um, the, I guess the abilities that I might have, the challenges, the new things that I think I might possibly, you know, stumble upon or stumble over or be big obstacles, whatever it might be. Um, if just, if there's just that, that there's that inkling of a chance that it just might work out, um, I'm all in. And if there's an inkling of a chance that it, or even bigger chance that I, I just might feel really badly at it, then I'm even more excited. That's really powerful because I think the way you're looking at fear is in a way, some people would look at that and be so frightened. They never get started right? That's yes. something that repels them from their dreams and not pushes them towards it. And so this redefinition of fear for you, when did that really start to set in and you were like, okay, I'm really doing this now. I'm really running towards the things that scare me or the things that could maximize me. I think it started setting in when, when I really realized I wasn't a goal oriented person in a sense of like, um, five or 10 year goals. Um, it started setting in when what I did was focus on how I was managing my time and then looking at my abilities and my interests and my, this word for me, which sums up kind of how I look at everything, um, my curiosity, I'm an extremely curious person, which is why I end up doing um, a number of things. Um, and when I was looking at my time management, when that got better and better and better, and I realized how much I could stretch out of my day and the amount of things I could actually, if I had the right team and could delegate well and could practice great leadership and um, let things go when it wasn't for me and it wasn't um, a strength point of mine and it was someone else's strength and I could collaborate and, and uh, continue then to, I guess, do better and create greater greater products or final, um, final results by doing that, I, I started seeing that I could push myself even further. So when I 
had in my mind said, if I was a five-year goal person, these would be the five-year goals, but it won't be my goals. But I want to try something. I want to see if I maximize every single day and get the most out of that day and rather focus on how I can have the goal at the end of each day to do these things and be as productive as possible, I may be able to get that five-year goal um, kind of goal, <laughs> a five-year goal mission or aim or goal down to a few, a few years less or a couple years less. And so I took the approach of being as productive as possible because I had this theory that if we set goals that we want this and this by this particular point, I had the fear that I'd only work as hard as I thought would be required to get to that point in five years, right? Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah. So I'm like, but if I actually could get the most out of every day and really squeeze as much as I could out of each day, I could probably bring those goalposts a whole lot closer. And when I did that, I actually ended up getting, um, you know, let's say out of those five things, which are my five-year goals, I managed to achieve about three of them in two years and the fourth and the fifth in the third and the fourth year. And so when that happened, I just really realized that this is the only way then that I, I need to live. And now there's the only way that I know how to live. I find that when I'm focusing on how I can get the most out of both myself and the people that I work with um, or you know, even clients that I work for, if I can get them to really apply themselves, how we can really combine forces to get the most out of what we do in those short periods of time and have even better results, then we will be able to get a whole lot further, a whole lot quicker. And I think that's why I've been very fortunate with like, for example, I mentioned the clients, the brands that I work with. So very much an under promise person and I'll give you kind of what you're looking for and I'll smile about the things you kind of hoping for in your KPIs and I'll ensure that we smash those KPIs, but in the most natural way possible. I'm the one who's always giving the strategies, giving the ideas, pushing them to do this and do that and be more authentic about that and how they're missing the point. And I've been lucky that with the brands I work with, they allow me to strategize and consult and will kind of pass things by me um, first before they go ahead with a campaign or whatever it might be. And I think when you start allowing yourself to play out of the boundaries in the box of where you're supposed to be and where, oh, and, 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 and I guess where everyone else plays and how it's supposed to be done, then you start to realize when you have a lot more room to stretch your, you know, your arms and stretch your legs and get more out of your space, then you can, make so much more happen. And it's less about achieving, um, but it's more about, it's more about executing for me. Mm. You know, it's, it's, um, it, it, I'm not driven by like achievements and, and things like accolades or awards. And it's like, how can I execute as best as possible something that I put my mind to? And if I can do that as, as, as well as possible, and I, if I can put in the time and the effort then everything else that is lauded and celebrated and that people work towards ends up being a byproduct. And I've kind of just focused on that where I feel that I'm still scraping the barrel. Um, I still haven't pushed myself as, as much as I possibly could. At the same time, I'm still trying to find the balance of still remembering to um, enjoy the roses and the flowers along the way. Um, but I'm just lucky that I get to enjoy every single thing that I do. And I think that's, um, that's definitely, you know, a bonus in, in getting to, to live the life that I do. Oh, everything you said, it almost captures this quote that I once read that people underestimate what they can do in a day and overestimate mm -hmm. what they can do in a year. And yeah. for me, what you have just described is basically being so purposeful about every day that you're living, that you know you do bring these things to fruition and your hard work does end up paying off because you're constantly crafting and you're constantly you know, in that alignment with what it is that you're looking to achieve or to do. And I love that because I think 
you a media personality. And I think sometimes when people look at, you know, someone like you, there's a lot of connotations that comes with that. They're like, oh, you're so lucky. His dad must be someone. He must have just fallen into this. He must have been this. And for me, all I'm hearing is work, 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 and have a focus and have a vision. And I love that. So speaking about your popularity or your fame, I'll put it, um, when was the first time you realized that, okay, <laughs> like I might be somebody? <laughs> oh, that's a really good question. Um... I'd say probably, so I used to, I used to present a schoolboy rugby show on Supersport uh, when I was about 19. And I think at the end of that year, I was getting onto a flight and I was still kind of new to flying. I'd flown for the first time the year before. Um, and I was getting on a flight and one of the, flight attendants came to me and said um are you are you maps from um classic clashes and i said uh yeah is it that i do something wrong she's like no please can i just have your autograph and then and then i was like my, my autograph i'm i'm what, what do you mean she's like yes please um i i watch your show all the time with my brother he's a rugby player and 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 i just kind of thought oh geez that, that was actually that was kind of uh, weird, but cool. Um, but may maybe this, geez, it, like that person, person recognized me. So then, then I kind of, um, kind of just saw it as just maybe it was just a one sort of thing. And when I was growing up, uh, my father was a footballer, and he he was unfortunately one of those footballers who were um, born just in the wrong era in South Africa. So they played um, under sanctioned conditions. They couldn't play locally and football wasn't professional at the time. And so my dad worked three jobs while being a professional footballer. Um, and so you just kind of played it for the passion, you know, days of John Masano and Asen Ling and all those um, great legends. And so, when I was growing up, I was always stopped by people um, with, when I was with my dad and he was always signing autographs and he was always taking pictures. And, you know, sometimes, um, you know, in fact, most of the time I was the one taking the pictures and photographs and whatever, um, and, and um, being the back for him to sign shirts for, for people. And so he's always kind of maintained a really, really great career and um, great um, esteem for the, man that he is in terms of how he always kind of treated people who supported him and he's always been a very kind and generous man with his time and i remember him and i went went out somewhere i was around 23 years old i had just won uh, cosmos cosmos SA, SA sexiest man and we went out and of course as always with my dad these people come kind of rushing and they're like Ah, oh, Mr. Mapunyani, Mr. Mapunyani, please may we have a photo? And um, he was like, yeah, sure, no problem, no problem at all. So then they proceeded to give him the camera and stood around me and then they posed for the photo and he was like, oh, wow, that, that they did, oh, they wanted one with, with you, not with, and I think the day that people brushed my father aside <laughs> and came running to, to me and gave him the camera, um, for a photo was also quite a quite an interesting moment where where he was like okay fine looks like um yeah looks like you are you are the the Mapunyani in the family now and have passed on the baton so mm -hmm. I think one of those silly moments which are more sentimental is the moment of like making it but like the true moments in the industry are when I was you know because as when you're growing up in the industry as a um, presenter and a model and everything and you're quite new, you just do whatever you're told, you know, because you just, um, you're, you're just, um, you're always seen as an object and you just are placed and you just do whatever you're told. And so I think the moment where about four years into the industry, when I'd managed to really back a lot of my work up with great shows um, and as well as um, a great catalog of different campaigns and 
um, you know, having a really good reputation in that regard was when clients would start asking me, how do you think we should do this? And which way would you say this would be the best direction for this? Um, and this is our voice, but how, how would you say it? And what do you think we should change? And, 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 and when I wasn't the object anymore and I was actually someone who could be a part of the project because they respected my opinion and I had a little bit more authority, I think is when um, I really started understanding how, how much I'd grown within the industry, so to speak. Less about um, the fame side of things, you know, getting to go here and getting to go there and travel in this way. I think for me, is be, it's, it's always about being seen. Um, that matches a whole lot more than than all the other stuff because that's what the that's what everyone else sees but they don't know what happens behind the scenes um, and the amount of work that it takes to build up certain things and what goes into it um, and how grueling it can all be it's uh, it's quite special when you know how much people how much work people have put in and then they still want to know what you think to really make it work um, is, is something that was quite important to me because there would be days where you just kind of feel um, maybe humiliated is not the right word but where you're just kind of being prodded and pushed and told to stand this way and and then when you're talking and you're doing a show then telling you to walk like this and that but those are all little learnings um, you know to get into a point where I had um, a whole lot more understanding and the reason I had to really stick all of that out and listen as much as possible until I found my own voice. Sorry, that's a long-winded answer. No, no, I love it. <laughs> I absolutely love it. Right. But you mentioned something about, you know, being seen. Um, and I think because you're in front of the camera, because you've got like such a big fan base, I guess people would think to themselves, but you're always seen, you're always visible, right? And people have... Yeah form this connection with you, whether it be through your social media or through the work that you do. And a lot of people I'm sure would assume they know you. So how do mm. you manage that? How do you navigate when people um, really come up to you with a sense of assumption of the person you should be and it doesn't really correlate with the person you are? Um, I think I every time just kind of surprise people in that regard. I, I always, I don't try to live up to, every, uh, to anything at any given time. I just try and, um, as cliche as it is, like I literally just try and be as much of myself as possible. And a lot of the time people are uh, quite surprised. They're like, you know, they, they think, they, they assume that I was a little bit unapproachable maybe, or they thought I would have been a little bit haughty or um, I don't know, you know, uh, I'll, I'll use a better term, or arrogant or something. Um, I was going to say up my own, but anyway. Um, but, you know, I, um, I, I, I don't know. I just, I think it's just so much of an effort to have to worry about pleasing people the whole time or to even worry about needing to be someone to the masses and someone else to um, other people and then still be a different personality when people meet you. I'm always trying to establish how consistent I can be because it's um, it's kind of hard enough living all of that under the spotlight. So why would you make it even harder for yourself to live by trying to be someone else? You know, I think I think for me, the danger always lies in the fact that you need to, once again, going back to what, you, what we first spoke about, you need to always kind of keep in mind who you are and find that the consistency in that. Otherwise the danger lies in you not, not being true to that point. So it's kind of like if you, I'd say really just focus on, um, if you try and be someone else, right? If you, if you spend too much time focusing on trying to be someone or something else, you'll end up forgetting who you are. And we see that all the time. Um, and I think for me, it's important to be cognizant all the time of not trying to be some, someone or anything else and being cognizant of, of who I am because, because then once again, I can never really be doubtful of where I am as a result and what my decision is when it comes to this or that and how this is probably not going to be a good look because um, it, I, I've put up this image and if this happens, then now I have to be worried about how I'm perceived because 
that actually is not possible. Or now I've been trying to show off this and now I can't afford this um, because now people are going to think I've fallen off because of what I've been showing them. I just try and make my life as honest and as manageable as I can and, and, and rem remind myself that I'm human in the things that I do and, and just try and make sure the things that I do are true. Mm. And now and again, obviously, we, we slip up. But I always try and make sure that I'm in touch with that as much as, as, much as I can be. Um, yeah, and I think that's really, that's really that on that for me. I would, I, would take out a, I would take it on another tangent, but, you know, kind of simply put, it's, um, it's really just that. No, that's beautiful. And I'm um, going back to a conversation we had the first time. And you mentioned something along the lines of the only time you've ever gotten into a fight or you felt like you had to be defensive was when you were fighting for someone else. And I love mm. that. <laughs> so it's like, that is actually the coolest thing. And of course, the conversation we were having was about gender-based violence and the state yeah. of the country. Um, and I want to know, where does that come from? Where does your need, because I know you studied um, human rights, actually, international human rights, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Um, so I want to know your passion for international human rights and just for standing up for people. Where does that come from? That's a bit of a loaded question because it takes me to so many different places. But for me, it comes from the fact that I, oof, there, there, there's so many different reasons. And I realize now when you ask that, no one's actually asked that before, I don't think. So that's, that's a great question. Because um, I've realized my, my mind has literally taken me to seven different things that would have impacted on that. But I'll just touch on three, if that's okay. Perfect. One of the things is that I, from the first words I ever spoke to the age of about 12, had a very severe stutter. And so I really struggled with the most simple form of communication, which is a speaking to the next person, right? And I, I, would, I wouldn't be able to get words out of my mouth. I would trip over a sentence. I wouldn't be able to complete a sentence. Um, I'd be mocked all the time. Adults thinking they were helpful would try and finish my sentences, which, which would be even more kind of um, lowering of my self-esteem. And I found that like very demeaning as a result. But, you know, those kinds of things as a result made me always feel and on many occasions were just unseen because at the end of the day, I was kind of written off when it came to having a voice. That's why having a voice to me is very important because I now have the ability to use my voice eloquently and articulate the things I want to say in the most impactful form. And, and so things like that really got me thinking on things such as prejudice, because lots of judgments were made on my level of um, intelligence or ability or contribution because I had this really bad stutter. And so I hated the fact that people just made these blink of an eye judgments based on this and that. And it's something that we carry out throughout our different prejudices because someone isn't like us um, or because they are perceived to not be of a certain level or standard or status, then we write them off. Another thing, was growing up in Soweto. I grew up in Protea North. My grandparents lived in Midlands and Dobsonville, respectively. And I spent a lot of time there. And as things kind of got better for my family, we moved out and moved to, um, still in the south of Joburg, but like Naturena, Mondio side. And we, you know, we, we moved into this kind of nicer neighborhood. And I then also got to go to a really good school. And as I was being formed in the school, I'd always go back, you know, to um, our, our old home or to go see my grandparents. And you just see how so many people who, who grow up in different situations now have to be dealt with this card in their lives and they just have to kind of deal with it. And I realized how lucky I was to have had the opportunities and the narrative that my life has taken for things to fall into place the way they did. And 
it's nothing about me being special in any other way. I just got the opportunities, A, and have been, you know, being able to move slightly further ahead in life compared to a lot of the people that I grew up with in, um, in, 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 in Soweto in certain, in certain parts of my life because of the way I have a certain command of the English language, which is also one of the most ridiculous things in South Africa, considering we have 12 languages, unofficially 12, um, but 11 languages. Um, but how we have so many languages, but still the one that determines whether or not you'll really make it as far as you possibly could is how well you speak English. I mean, that's ridiculous, right? Um, we have the greatest gap in, 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 in poverty. So the highest inequality in the world. And once again, if you're born into the wrong home or you're in the wrong place or you don't get the right opportunities, or once again, your parents maybe don't um, speak a certain way, or you're not brought up in the city, you know, all these different things add up to you having less and less and less of a chance, which means you won't be able to make the most of your life. And once again, purely because of greed in the world, um, not everyone being able to share their wealth and help others come out of poverty and be able to, and, and be able to have a little bit more equality of sorts. And so things like that and seeing people being mistreated, people being hurt, um, seeing a lot of um, crime, seeing um, in some cases a lot of abuse, woman abuse, seeing children being left on the side of the street or abused by their parents, whatever it might be, realizing how I'm so, uh, I was so lucky that a lot of those things did not happen to me. And I'm only where I am now because those things really didn't happen to me and leave the scar on my mind and life that with one bad action, one traumatic um, situation or incident where it can take a complete bend, I've been lucky that with the things that have happened, they've just made me stronger and they've been mild enough to actually shape me into someone who is better as opposed to someone who is bitter, right? And so having, being able to differentiate between those two things and be conscious of that and not being left to being bitter because of my circumstances has made me want to fight for people who have no choice for survival, but to approach things with anger because of the cards that they dealt. And it's as simple as just being felt like they're not seen, not ne they're completely neglected, not considered, not um, um, kind of given the integrity of being someone that is a citizen with a vote that matters, that contributes, without being able to actively play in the economy um, and be actually appreciated as a citizen uh, because you know, you're not being given opportunities, you're not um, given access, you are literally just there to just take up space. You're another number, part of the census, and so you're South African, but we're doing nothing for you. Um, or you are perhaps um, disabled in some way. So now you're also neglected and are left uh, and, and marginalized and left with very little opportunity. Whatever it might be, all kinds of different rights and violations of human rights, you end up then living a life of potential unfulfilled. And I think for me, it's because that's my fear, I always want people to get that opportunity and for people to not then resort to the bitterness of how they were treated and then embarking that um, treatment on other people making their lives hell um, because you know, they need to go down with them and always seeing how I can play my part to be able to make sure that other people can reach their potential. And I think that's always how I, how I look at things. So because of that and because of always saying when I was growing up, this is unfair, that's unfair, this is unfair. My parents actually thought I'd be a lawyer because I was always, you know, speaking about fair, fair, fair. And I think that that also came from the fact that when we left the township, a few of my best friends stayed there and went to schools there. And we obviously then got out of touch because now we're living separate lives, you know? Now I'm going back to Kasi and I'm still, you know, Gimotswana and I'm still like there with everything, but you lose a lot of the nuances and then Yanong, you consider the cheese boy. You know, now you, you, you call it cheese boy because now you can um, have a little better opportunities because of what you're afforded 
in that regard. But the essence of you is never lost. And I would always kind of really struggle with that. And then you just realize that, unfortunately, it's just how life works. And some people get opportunities and some others don't because of you know their, their situations and their families and their lives. But I always thought that, that was unfair. And because I always thought that was unfair, I've always then always challenged myself to see how I could make things fair as a result. One of the life philosophies I have stemmed from something being unfair. And that was when I was seven years old. Um, I was speaking to my parents about something and then they had said, well, you know, sometimes it's not, you know, what you know, it's who you know. And I kind of didn't really think I understood that properly. So I just cast it aside. And then that same week, because sometimes when you hear something for the first time, you like, I've never heard that before. And then you hear it more and more and more often because now your ears are looking out for it subconsciously. I'm sure you've had that too. You know, it's even the same as bumping into someone and you've never met them before. Now you see them everywhere. Um, and, and it's actually, I think about that with you as well because we'd never met before. We had that interview. Now I see you all the time. I'm like, oh, that's Candace. It's my girl. Um, anyway, and so then I heard another adult say in a conversation, yeah, but it's not what you know, it's who you know. And I came back home and I said, I heard you and dad say this the other day. And I heard these adults say this, but that doesn't make sense. Does that mean sometimes if you just know the right person, even if you know so much more, you're not going to be given that opportunity because you know the person? Mm -hmm. And they said, yeah, unfortunately, that sometimes is how life works. And I said, no, but that's, that's not fair. And they're like, you're being naive. Don't worry, you'll understand when you're older. And so I really deliberated that over that nonstop to try to figure out how I could break that um, or how I could counter that argument. And in my teens somewhere, and I still am like that every day, is, is when I kind of realized that, you know what, actually, my goal is always to flip that on its head with everything that I do and focus on the fact that if you love what you do, if you work hard at it, no matter where you are, no matter what your life situation is, no matter where you're starting off, you love what you do, you work hard at it, you're willing to put in the passion and the hours, right? Then that usually like accumulates you to being damn good at what you do, right? And as a result of that, you change the whole thing from it's not what you know, it's who you know, into the person that the who you know wants to know because you're so damn good at what you do and you can't be ignored. And I think that's where I always have a lot of respect for people who just silently work in the trenches and they've been doing this for years and years and years, but they've developed this level of skill that has been waiting for this opportunity and they've taken it. And that's why earlier in the point when I said I could go into different tangents, I wanted to say that you make your own luck. You know, people, you're saying people say, you know, you're so lucky, whatever it might be, you create your own luck. And I think for me, I've always known what I want and what I'm willing to do to get there. And I'm going to put it out there and I'm going to work towards that, but I'm not going to just sit there because I put it out there and hopefully it comes my way. I'm going to be, I'm, I'm going to make sure that I'm so prepared for it. I'm going to put in the research, the work, the hours, everything. So that as soon as there's a tiny gap in the door for me to be able to open that, I'm going to take it with both hands because for a lot of people, these opportunities come and they're like, Oh no, no, I'm not ready. I'm not ready. Just give me a little bit more time. And then it's gone. And for me, it's always working on how I can always constantly be as ready as possible so that when those opportunities come that I'm able to take them with both hands. And um, I think those are the attributes to what's gotten me to where I am. Oh, I love it because throughout, you know, the conversation, I think we started at a place where you were telling us your work ethic, right? And now where we are in the conversation, it just makes so much sense because it's, your perspective is shaped as you go through life. And when you realize, because not a lot of people can realize privilege or that fact that, you know what, I was lucky in this arena, yeah. the fact that I did mm. get out, the fact that I do speak English well, the fact that, you know, I've got a certain thing, whatever that thing is, like mm. you're very good at maths, whatever it is for you. And that is something that I can use to empower myself and build my career but it's also something I can use to empower others and I think mm. it's just such a powerful way that you're framing it because I think a lot of people will sit back and say well I don't know anyone right and they'll say ah it isn't what you know to you know and it's to a certain degree it's true 
But what you said mm. for me just hits the nail on the head because it is about that preparation firstly. So you feel comfortable when you meet this person who's the person yeah. you know. But then it's also allowing yourself the skill set to know that you're going to present the best possible you when that opportunity comes around. And when mm -hmm. people say to me like, oh no, you know, you're so lucky that you spoke to this or that person. Um, I'm always like, yeah, because I stalked them half to death. Like they were scared. Yeah. <laughs> you know? This could have gone one of two ways. I could have been in jail or I could have gotten an interview. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. No, it's really beautiful. It's really beautiful. I want to go to uh, something you spoke about, which is basically because you sound very grounded. Um, and I want to speak about, you know, your parents because you, you mentioned your mom. Oh, sorry, go on. Just, just on, on, on that, actually, um, when I got my first kind of media gig, um, my, basically when I was in matric, my parents had very, very difficult times financially. And by the time I finished my, my matric finals, my dad's company got liquidated. Um, my mom had been unemployed for two years. And they basically said, listen, we've sent you to the school. It still left us in quite a bit of debt. Um, you might not be able to go to university next year. Um, we can't help you. You're on your own, right? And so I took a forced year off where I had to go and find work. But when I'd overcome my stutter, I always said, whatever I do in the future, I have to monetize my oratory skill because I'm going to be, I want to be able to flip this disadvantage that I really struggled with into my advantage. And that's why I've always worked on that a lot and then a lot and a lot as, as often as I can. And in January of 2019, I was still 18, my school sports coach said, hey, so I got a call from this, um, this producer from the show for Supersports and they're calling around the different schools asking if they, you know, if anyone would be willing to come for auditions for the school boy rugby show. And I thought of you and I thought of how much you love um, communicating and how much you love sports and especially, you know, um, the sports that you played in school. So I just figured, you know, I also know what's going on at home. Could be a cool opportunity. Go try this out. And I would always speak to myself in the mirror when I was home and I would work on my presentation and I'd come up with a random word and try build a speech off of that word and uh, did Toastmasters and things like that where you need to be able to think quick on your feet and, and, and because I always kind of thought of maybe being able to do those things that involve me speaking publicly, or hosting a show, this or that. And they just said, literally, they, they said, the audition's tomorrow, just go. And I went for the audition and I got the job and that's what got the ball rolling. And it's that whole thing of when preparation meets opportunity and how that then equals how that journey kind of follows on bigger and better things. And then my second job, well, that's, that was actually my second job. My first job before that was, um, well, during that I was an assistant at Aka Joe. Um, I was um, selling clothes at Aka Joe. And my third job, I was also really interested in fashion. And SA Fashion Week was something I always wanted to go to. And there was the, she's still there, the director of SA Fashion Week, a lady called Lucilla Boyson. And very, very stern kind of woman, very Devil Wears Prada. Um, I forgot Meryl Streep's character, but, you know, that kind of very, don't mess with her, fiery, but, but soft when you when you're able to really connect with her and, and, and really understand her. And she'd never hired a man before at all. And I went there, I was just trying to find some sort of work uh, because I was interested in learning in the fashion industry. And I asked to be her PA. She said, no, sorry, I don't know if I can have um, you as a PA. You know, what do you really know about fashion? And I kind of said, I promise you, um, I, I'm very organized. I'm willing to learn a, I don't know, Anything you throw at me, I'll just be able to cotton onto very quickly. Anyway, so I kind of, it was the same thing. I would have either been arrested because I end up stalking her just trying to get that job um, or, or gotten the job. In the end, I, I, I got the job. And I was a first male PA. And I did that for a couple seasons, which got me in the right rooms and the right places because I also loved fashion and I was always kind of always well presented thanks to my mom because even at school if a button broke off our blazer we'd have to make sure that we sewed it before we got home because she never allowed 
um, that to happen or we were punished as a result. Um, and so then I got that and I think all those kinds of things of just being persistent with whatever it is that I wanted and how I was willing to, you know, just work my way up are all parts of things that led to, you know, this point. And, 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 and that's really um, what I want to touch on in that kind of luck space. You create your own luck um, and, and it's important to realize that too. Well, thank you for sharing that. I think that's so beautiful to also transfer because I think many people are so afraid of asking because they're afraid of being rejected. And so when they yeah. get the first rejection, they're like, oh, it means it's not for me. It just means maybe you need to come through the window next time, <laughs> or the chimney, or the fire. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 hundred percent. And and actually on that with 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 modeling, I only started modeling because a friend of mine said, "Listen, I know he's trying to make extra money for Varsity next year." So, I beg your pardon. So verbatim, my friend said, um, "You're you're not bad to look at. So why don't you try modeling?" And I was like, oh, "I don't know if that's my thing." And in the end, I was just like, you know what, I actually need, I, I need this. If I can get a little bit of extra cash, then, then I'll, I'll definitely take it on. And I had went to five agencies who all turned me down. And then the fifth one took a gamble. And that ended up being like the first thing that really broke um, through for me. And I had all of those five agencies asking if I was interested to go back. And it was always the case for them of just being looking a lot, just, just too much like the guy next door, too geeky. You got the glasses, just not going to work. And within a few years, as a result of all of that and really managing to make a bit of a name for myself, there were all those kinds of clones in the industry and in those agencies. And for me, it was important then each time I got denied or turned down for being the guy with the glasses and looking like the, the, the boy next door, whatever it might be, I then decided this is going to be my trademark and this is what's going to like distinguish it. And, and I'm never going to compromise on that. Um, depending sometimes if it's something that I had to, if I had to really be able to compromise, but um, you'd still know it was um, me, then it ended up being a thing that was a signature and, and, and distinguished me quite nicely. And then you had a lot of, people who try to replicate the same look. And I think it's really important to then just kind of always back yourself, mm. just always back yourself in, in anything I do. And I think even today I was lucky to have um, spent some time with, with my friends and, and, and someone said, how do, you, how do you do it? And for me, it's never anything I, I ever overthink. You know, when things work out really well or I balance the time with this and that, people always just sadly tell themselves, yeah, I'm not so sure if I can do it. Honestly, I don't know if I'll be able to do it. I think I should rather leave it and not do it at all. Um, yeah, it's not, I just don't think I've got the ability. It's too much of a risk, whatever it might be. I'm crazy in that way that whatever it is, I just back myself. I use my imagination. What's the worst that could happen? A lot of the time, the worst is really bad, but I'll, I'll still back myself that it can be really good. And my approach of really not having a plan B with what I do um, and rather the plan B being something that is subsequent to having really forced plan A, um, I'm just lucky that it's got like a 95% success rate or 90% success rate. Um, and that 10% has been a thrill in itself too. Hmm. When you said always back yourself, like to me that really stood out because I think so many people struggle to do that. They will vouch for a friend, they will vouch for a parent, for a sibling, but when it comes to themselves, they're like, oh, I don't know, you know? <laughs> and I think that is so crucial. You have to, you have to be willing to say, I know this is gonna happen. How? Yeah. I might have planned to have a direct flight there. I might stop in Mexico. I might then reroute to Sydney and da da da. But I'm getting to where I'm going. And I think that's such yeah. a powerful mindset to have. And I think it's so important that you put it out there because I think, you know, you at a place in your life where many people are looking at you and they're like, oh, I want to be the next maps, right? I want to be, do what he's doing. I want to represent the organizations he's representing. However, they're not looking at like all these things that you've just mentioned the time balance, number one, the rejection that you had to go through, the skill that you had to develop. And just speaking on skill, it's so funny, you posted 
something the other day where you were like doing a matrix style pose. I don't, I don't even know how yeah. to go back to do that, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> I remember reading your caption and I was just like, oh, you are so witty. I love following you on social media because your captions Thanks. are so quick witted. <laughs> I was like, this guy's great. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, and you know, I think that goes back to um, my my love for my love for words and 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 language. Um, I love playing around with words and language. I love having as much fun with the most mundane sentence or or conversation um, whenever I'm involved in it. And I think it's just such a wasted opportunity when you have to present something to people to not bring a lot of enjoyment into that. Like, how do you, it's like when, when a chef is making um, pop and flesh, right? And you go to a five-star restaurant and they say they take on pop and flesh, they take as really the fact that it's going to be presented like in the <laughs> kind of way. And you're going to really be like, oh my gosh, this pup is just, oh, it's unbelievable. But I mean, really, it's just pop and flesh, right? Um, and I think, it's like, well, that's, that, that's what creates enjoyment and excitement for them. So you want to have fun with it. And how do you change those flavors a little bit to still be able to give people pop and flakes? Um, and I think I just really love, love that challenge. And I've always had a bit of a, um, a cheeky streak or sense of humor. Um, and I, I like to play around with it. I'm a, I'm a logophile and I love language and linguistics. And I always try and see how I can intertwine them. Sadly people you know for the most part especially on on twitter um when i make comments or whatever miss it um and it tends to be i can be very sarcastic sometimes in a nice way and there tends to be what what i um kind of refer to as a sarcasm on on twitter where there is a real chasm within you making the sarcastic comment and, and the sarcasm S-A-R-C-H-A-S-M is the gap between you telling us, you making a sarcastic comment or a, a joke that is sarcastic and them actually getting it. And sometimes it just never gets to the other side. That's a chasm that, that happens quite often. And that's a lot of fun to just be like, uh, I want to explain, but it's just, it's gone now. So that's fine. But I mean, it, it's all, me, to me, it's important to do that as well because people assume that especially because of my approach on how I do things that I'm really take myself seriously. But the reality is that I, I don't F around with my efforts with my work and I, and I'm, and I'm serious about my work and I'm serious about the things that I do, but I don't take myself too seriously because then it just ends up feeling too much like work and is driven by work and is driven by this false sense of success, um, which people always have. I think for me, for me, people have the wrong definition of, and that's really because I have a different definition. Everyone has a different definition, but the societal definition is not the one I try and follow when it comes to that. And so I, I then just like to remind people that I am kind of very silly and human and, um, you know, just like them and, happy to self-deprecate and, 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 and make fun of myself and, and enjoy something that is also simple and it doesn't always have to be um, serious and rigid and stiff and just trying to get those likes or whatever it is. I'm just like, I like this image. I'm going to post this. I'm going to have fun with it. And I hope you enjoy it too. And I hope it makes you do what Kanda's mom is doing right now while I'm talking, which is put a smile on your face. No, it does. It's fantastic. And my last question to close it off on this beautiful Heritage Day is when are you writing a book? Because I think it would be one hell of a thing to read. If you, if you hear my real kind of thoughts on people writing books um, <laughs> at 30, like autobiographies and stuff, um, I'll, be, I'll definitely be given a tough time for being very shady and spicy. But I don't, I, I really just don't think, unless you've had an earth shattering or life shattering experience, um, or you've discovered or created something that has changed the way the world functions, 
or you have, I don't know, just done something that is just so mind blowing that it's really done by anyone in the world. I don't see why you're writing a book before like 40, honestly, about yourself. And so the answer to your question is about me, I don't know. I firstly don't find myself interesting enough to do so, um, nor do I kind of, I don't know. I just, I think I've still got a, I don't think I've had enough life experiences, but great experiences, but I think I'm, I've still got such a, I still have like another 20 years, I think, you know, before I can write a kind of a autobiography, unless I do something amazing during, during that time. But to answer your, the other part of that question, well, to answer that question, but in another way, my other answer is next year. Because my biggest passion is youth and education. And one of my biggest frustrations in South African um, education right now is the fact that 72% of kids who are in grade four in South Africa are illiterate. And part of that is the culture that we have, or lack thereof, amongst black families to read to our kids and to get them interested in that and get them curious about what this word is and that word is. And I was actually only lucky to really discover that, but apart from going to um, a, a, a good school, I was lucky to discover that because the way I overcame my stutter was that I had to read a lot and read aloud and try and find a rhythm with my thoughts and mouth not jamming and seeing if I could find some kind of a flow. And that's what got me really interested in literature and showed the power that literature had to get you out of whatever situation that you're in. Mm -hmm. And so I will be writing a children's book and um, that's just so that there is more excitement around that, especially if someone who kids kind of tend to look towards as wanting to follow because they want to be in the media and the arts and live this life and everything. They fail sadly to recognize that that takes a lot of work and it requires them to go to school and that it's not just about being a DJ or presenter or whatever and um, that school doesn't matter. I think it's important for me to try to see how I can make it from an early age really cool to read, to get parents who are my peers to read to their four, five, six-year-olds, seven-year-olds, start that culture going, especially with me writing a children's book and them seeing that if I write children's books and whatever, that there actually might be a career in that too and get them excited about that. But more than anything, have stories that are um, representative of their lives, that are relatable, that they can engage with, written by um, you know, people that interest them and written for young black kids. Um, and as a result, then hopefully that would make them more excited too, because they can actually relate to the subjects within the book. And I think we're getting better with that in South Africa. There are more and more um, authors that are writing children's books, but we need a whole lot more literature out there because there's still very few opportunities because we're only seeing Sally and Tim um, in the books as the main characters and we need we need more um, you know Sipo, Jabulani and more characters that 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 are representative of, of of who we are so that's that's my that's my mission and that will be I'm going to commit to it now so I have to do it that will hopefully be done and completed by mid last year and come out come out next year Oh, Did I say mid last year? Sorry, yeah, mid next year. Like... <laughs> come on. I'll hopefully be mid next year. Come on. But it's okay. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's perfect. Maps, this has been such a just, you know, incredible conversation. You've enlightened me, and I'm pretty sure you're enlightening people that are listening to you. So thank you for your time, but most importantly, just thank you for who you are. Um, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. I really appreciate that. I appreciate you. I love the work that you're doing. You're absolutely amazing. I hope we get to have more conversations um, and be able to make greater impacts through the different work that we're involved in. And hopefully we can do so together. And I, I commend you on, on the person that, that you are. And it was such a privilege to be able to speak to you. And may you continue to, to, to work, walk, not work, to walk 
in uh, the faith and belief of knowing that you are absolutely special in 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 your ability too. So good luck and thank you very much. Ah, oh, thanks, Maps, and have a great Heritage Day. Thank you. You too. Bye. Bye. There was so much I could have just spoken to Maps all day about. I mean, the wisdom, the practical skill that it takes to be successful, uh, the outlook, the real decision making that this is the life you're choosing and this is what you're willing to sacrifice for it. I mean, I learned so much in this interview. I'm still like rearing <laughs> and I really wish I could have spoken to Mops longer. But guys, if there's any quote or anything that stood out in particular for you, please do let me know. And as usual, don't forget to like, share, subscribe, and I'll speak to you next week.